Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 16554 in the name of Patrick Harvey on revoking Article 50. Can I ask those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Patrick Harvey to speak to and move the motion. Ten minutes, Mr Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before 2016 and since, the Greens have made our case for Scotland's place in the European Union. It is an imperfect institution, to be sure, but it has been one of the most successful peace projects in human history. It's one of the planet's strongest voices for action on climate change. It's clearly more democratic than the Byzantine system at Westminster, and it has given us perhaps the most extraordinary political achievement of the last 100 years, freedom of movement, which is not only a benefit to our economy, but a liberating principle for the people of Europe. More fundamentally, Europe is our neighbourhood, our community, our family. We don't want to leave. So, of course, we were dismayed at the result of the referendum in 2016. But what has happened since then has been worse than anyone could have imagined. The UK government has treated Scotland abysmally, but their treatment of the whole UK has been shabby too. They timed the 2016 referendum just weeks after the Scottish Parliament election. They announced a snap UK election right in the middle of our local elections. They refused to reach out, either across the Commons or to the nations, to seek consensus. They went to court to try and prevent MPs from having any say at all in invoking Article 50. And they opposed the safety lock mechanism of the meaningful vote as well, losing on that issue by just four votes. Every offer of political compromise has been utterly rejected. And then we had the continuity bill, a bill which, other than one small aspect which could easily have been corrected, was competent when passed. The UK government didn't like what we were doing with devolved legislation, so they first initiated a court case, then passed UK legislation retrospectively limiting the powers of this parliament without our consent and preventing the bill from becoming law. The consequence is that whatever legislation we now pass in devolved areas, we know that the UK government is both able and willing to retrospectively cut our powers to stop devolved laws coming into force when they don't like what we're doing. The Conservative Amendment, Adam Tompkins' Amendment today, tells us that the 2016 result should be respected. Should we respect the Leave campaign's criminality? Should we respect the racism of so many prominent Leave campaigners? Should we respect their refusal even to engage with the threat to peace in Ireland? Should we respect the numbers on the big red bus? Presiding officer, I respect many individual people who voted leave. And I respect their anger at the way the political status quo has failed them. But that failure lies at the door of successive UK governments, not the European Union. And it's the UK government which has not respected the result of that referendum. To respect that result, would be to respect that a 52-48 result is a knife edge. And that requires an effort to compromise and build consensus. They didn't do that. To respect the result would be to respect the different votes of the constituent parts of the UK, that famous partnership of equals. They didn't do that. They didn't respect the result. They were given an inch and they took it so much further than a mile. Mr. Tompkins' amendment tells us that the result should be delivered. This boils down to the absurd simplicity of just saying, get on with it, or just leave. We're way past that general argument. We're not interested in chasing unicorns any longer. Only a specific, coherent, and achievable path forward can be taken seriously. Mr. Tompkins' amendment also tells us that the best option is to leave with a withdrawal agreement, even though that agreement has been defeated resoundingly twice. And in the media today, the Conservatives are calling this whole debate self-indulgent. Apparently, creating this mess purely to address their own party's internal ideological divide, that's not self-indulgent at all. Prolonging this mess 
by refusing to reach out and seek consensus for staying inside the single market, that's not self-indulgent. Throwing a billion pound bung to the misogynist, homophobic, climate-denying sectarian marches of the DUP to keep their own hopeless prime minister in office, that's not self-indulgent at all. But anyone, anyone trying to stop this chaos and end the crisis the Tory party has forced on the country, that apparently is being self-indulgent. We're asked today to accept that Adam Tompkins and so many other Tory politicians who voted Remain, argued in favour of EU membership, agreed with Ruth Davison in the wake of the 2016 result that we should stay inside the single market and keep freedom of movement. We're asked now to accept that all of these people are now convinced that leaving the European Union will be wonderful, is the best course we could possibly take. Because, presiding officer, there is apparently nothing self-indulgent about them throwing their lot in with the self-appointed bad boys of Brexit and going along with this hard right coup. When I look at the words the Conservative Party are using today, respected, delivered, agreement, self-indulgent, I recognize all the words, but I don't think they mean what Adam Tompkins thinks they mean. Presiding officer, turning to the Labour position, I want to recognise and welcome the movement that's been shown. Hopefully, it is becoming clear that Labour and the Scottish Parliament are increasingly willing to accept that Brexit itself is a hard right project, which we must not simply roll over and accept, regardless of what Barry Gardner has to say. And I hope that Neil Finlay will be able to clarify some points when he speaks later to move his amendment. He prefers the term public vote to people's vote. I take it that he is still referring to a referendum with a remain option. And is the wording of his amendment intended to agree with us that if a withdrawal agreement, any withdrawal agreement, is to be adopted by the UK Parliament, it must be given back to the people to decide if it's what they want or if they prepare, prefer the current deal, the best deal of remaining inside the European Union with all of our rights, our protections, our democratic representation and the ability to shape regulations in the public interest. If that's the meaning of Mr Finlay's amendment, we'll support it to achieve the widest possible backing for the essence of the proposal that we've put forward. But if that isn't clear, there is still a majority in this parliament for the principle that the only ways forward are a referendum or revoking Article 50. Presiding officer, on Saturday, I marched through London with more than a million others, people from a range of political parties and people from no political party. Most of us never got anywhere near Parliament Square, so massive was the crowd we were walking with. And nearly six million people 5.8 million people at the last count, have signed the petition to revoke Article 50, a position which, thanks to Andy Whiteman and Ross Greer and Joanna Cherry and Catherine Styler and Alan Smith and David Martin, who took that case to the Supreme Court, thanks to them, we now know this is an option the UK can take unilaterally at any point before it leaves. As yet, we don't know. We don't know what the result will be tonight from the indicative pro vote process at Westminster. We can be fairly sure that it won't result in a, a simple, sudden clarity, a sort of first-past-the-post, winner-takes-all outcome. There will still be choices to make. There will still be uncertainty. There will still be the threat, the huge threat, of social, economic and political damage from any form of Brexit, and there will still be those trying to push the country over the cliff edge to deliberately make this crisis even worse. So I ask this parliament to make it clear this evening, two hours before MPs cast their votes, that one of two things must happen. Whether a withdrawal agreement is adopted or not, we must see an extension long enough to put it back to the people. And if that doesn't happen, then we must cancel the crisis revoke 
and move on. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Harvey. I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to move Amendment 1655.4. Cabinet Secretary, six minutes, please. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. I, I welcome this debate. It gives this parliament the opportunity to come together to exercise the kind of clear, constructive leadership so manifestly lacking in Westminster. Two days, two days to go before the UK was meant to leave the EU and there is still no plan that commands support. The Scottish Government have been clear and consistent since the EU referendum that continued membership of the EU is the best outcome for the whole of the UK. It is the outcome that Scotland voted for. The UK Government ignored that overwhelming vote in Scotland to remain. And the Prime Minister has ignored Scotland's national interests ever since. Compromise proposals have been dismissed and the Scottish and Welsh governments have been shut out of negotiations and the unedifying spectacle of the Conservative Party tearing itself and the country apart in the process of trying to wrench the UK out of the EU has been deeply damaging to the reputation of the UK government and indeed the UK government itself at home and abroad. This is clear to everyone. Whatever their standpoint, as the latest social attitude survey made clear yesterday, neither Lever nor Remainer think that Brexit is being handled well. No wonder this entire sorry process has, from the very start, been all about the internal faction fighting in the Conservative Party, regardless of the impact on Scotland or indeed the rest of the UK. And Westminster has been in a state of permanent chaos. This afternoon, MPs will begin again to seek a way forward through a process of indicative votes. We will see if they can come to an accord. I fear, however, that there will continue to be disagreement. And that disagreement is why we must now refer the matter back to the people. Seeking a longer extension, indeed. Adam Tomkin. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Imagine, Cabinet Secretary, that Scotland had voted yes to independence in 2014. And imagine further that weeks away from Independence Day, there remained grave doubt about Scotland's future trading relations with the rest of the UK. And that unionists like me argued that because of this, independence should be revoked. How would the Cabinet Secretary have reacted in circumstances such as that? Cabinet what would Secretary, she have called no, unionists it was who an wanted intervention. to revoke a decision that Scotland Mr. should be independent? Mr Tompkins, an intervention or speech. speech. Cabinet Secretary. The, the only imagination is the lack of imagination by the UK Conservatives to actually come forward with anything that takes the country forward in any shape or form. And the lack of imagination is not one single member of the Conservative Party in Scotland that can surely express their own views of differences than that of the, the imperative they have to obey Theresa May, come what may. The circumstances have changed. The country is in chaos. And Westminster, Westminster has not delivered what Scotland needs. And that is why it's perfectly possible in a representative democracy for the, for the, for the UK government, as has been determined by the ECJ, to unilaterally uh, revoke Article 50 under those terms. Now, presiding officer, we don't know whether the UK, the UK Westminster Parliament will come to an accord, but seeking a longer extension to Article 50 would stop the block on Brexit, enable a new referendum on EU membership to be held, and we in the Scottish Government will support any such referendum, provided it has the option to remain in the EU on the ballot paper. But no one should be any, in any doubt. It is indeed just an opportunity not a guarantee for the wishes of the people of Scotland to be respected. It is only by becoming an independent country that we can guarantee the votes of people in Scotland will not be ignored. And a e new referendum on EU membership will also allow people to vote again. Now they have the facts at their disposal, rather than the false and incomplete prospectus that was offered in 2016. The 2016 EU referendum campaign was conducted with very limited information on which the public could decide and crucially no clarity from Brexit politicians whatsoever as to what a vote to leave might mean in practice or, or in a plan to delivering it. Every month new evidence emerges of troubling aspects of the EU referendum and the campaign that preceded it. These range from financial impropriety to illegal and inappropriate external influences. 
Given the enormity of the issue at stake and the relative narrow majority across the UK as a whole, these are far from trivial and answers Adam Tompkins' point. Since 2016, Brexit politicians have contorted themselves in contradiction to their original argument. It is therefore impossible to tell which, if any, form of Brexit has most support and how that compares to remaining in the EU. A new EU referendum would pitch a specific option for Brexit against Remain to test the public's view when faced with a genuine choice. And if the Prime Minister can ask the House of Commons, Commons uh, and if the Prime Minister can ask the House of Commons to vote multiple times on the same deal, it is outrageous to deny the people of Scotland and the UK a chance to vote again. Now the facts have become clear. And the scale. The sights and the sounds of the march in London on Saturday and the growing momentum of the petition on the revocation of Article 50, now the biggest ever and still growing, gives us cause for hope amid the Westminster despair. Brexit should be halted for a new referendum to take place or Brexit should be brought to an end through voting Article 50 to avert the catastrophe of a crash out with no deal. And I believe that today's motion can be strengthened to reflect the outrage that the UK continues to ignore the views of this parliament and of the overwhelming majority of people in Scotland who wish to remain. This chamber has been consistent in expressing the view which the motion sets out. It is high time that our view alongside millions of others is listened to. I urge Parliament to support this amendment and to support the final motion. Thank you. Before I call Adam Tompkins, I have a little time in hand to give time back to members who take interventions until I have no time left. I call Mr Tompkins to speak to move amendment 16554.1. Please, Mr Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, on these benches, we believe that referendum results must be respected and delivered, not ignored and overlooked. When a parliament legislates to hand a question to the people directly, that parliament is not looking for an opinion, but asking for a decision. And whether we like it or not, the British people voted in June 2016 that the United Kingdom should leave the European Union. And that was a decision, that was a, in a few moments, that was a decision not of half a million people on a march in London, not even of five million people signing a decision, but of 17.4 million people right across the whole of the United Kingdom, including, of course, a million people in Scotland. Now, I was not among their number. I voted to remain but I am absolutely not among the number of politicians who think that the result of a referendum can be ignored just because it delivered a verdict that we would have preferred not to see. As politicians and as Democrats, we are the servants, not the masters of the people. And when the people give their elected representatives a direct instruction, as they did in June 2016, it is our duty to listen and to act on it. I'll give away to Mr. Harvey. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm grateful. If so many of the Brexiteers don't think Theresa May's withdrawal agreement is what they voted for. If even half the backbench of the Tory party don't think Theresa May's withdrawal agreement is what they voted for, then how on earth can Adam Tompkins tell us that 17 million people voted specifically for what is on offer now? And if they didn't, surely they need to be asked again, is this what you wanted or something else? Adam Tompkins. 17.4 million people voted for Brexit and the, withdrawal agreement is, and, and the withdrawal agreement will deliver precisely that. The withdrawal agreement will deliver Brexit. So, presiding officer, that's the first principle which has informed what we, the Scottish Conservatives, have had to say about Brexit since that referendum. That, that's to say that the referendum results must be respected and delivered. And the second principle is that Brexit must be delivered compatibly with the devolution settlement. And this means respecting that which is properly devolved to this Parliament, and it also means respecting that which is properly reserved to Westminster. And this is the core of the problem with today's Green Party motion, calling as it does for Article 50 to be revoked or for a second EU referendum to be held. For there is no minister accountable to this Parliament, presiding officer, with the legal power to do either of these things. The United Kingdom's international relations, including its relations with the European Union, are reserved to Westminster, just as they would be, incidentally, under any federal constitution. Now, this does not mean that this parliament can have no meaningful impact in ensuring that Brexit is delivered compatibly with devolution. Just this week, the Finance and Constitution Committee published a unanimous report which adds significant value to the ongoing debate about the need for common frameworks in the post-Brexit United Kingdom. Much could be gained from exposing that report, its conclusions and recommendations to further scrutiny and debate in this chamber. But that's not, no, that's not what the Green Party have chosen to do this afternoon, presiding officer. In my judgment, 
Opposition days in this Parliament are best used as opportunities to hold to account the Scottish Government, government. whose ministers are, after all, accountable to us. Yep. So it's unfortunate that the Greens have chosen to pass this opportunity up this afternoon. Presenting officer, three options face us now. We could leave the European Union in an orderly manner, avoiding cliff edges and economic shocks, transitioning smoothly from membership to exit in accordance with the withdrawal agreement that has been agreed by the EU27 and the UK government. Or we could crash out much more suddenly with no transition period and the real risk of significant economic shock. Or we could delay, perhaps indefinitely, flying in the face of the clear instruction to leave that the British people gave us in June 2016. Voters do not want the agony prolonged. They want us to get on with it. Yep. And the business community does not want an even lengthier yep. period of uncertainty. They want the deal closed. The course of action urged upon us by the Greens today would do grave damage to our politics, yep. all but destroying that delicate trust between voters and representatives that democracy relies on. To leave without a deal, no, to leave without a deal, in my judgment, risks doing similar damage not to our politics, but to our economy. And for this reason, presiding officer, I have never supported a no-deal Brexit, and I remain now as opposed to that course of action as I always have been. This leaves only one option, presiding officer, which is the option I've been advocating for since the withdrawal agreement was published in November. I want us to leave the European Union. I want us to leave under the deal negotiated and agreed by the UK government and the EU27. I want us to get on with it, and I want us to move on so that in future, opposition debates can be about the things that matter most to voters here. Skills, schools, hospitals, jobs, the economy, not endless manoeuvrings about constitutional process. Yep. I move the amendment in my name. Yeah. Thank you very much. I now call on Neil Finlay to speak to and move amendment 16554.3. Five minutes, Mr Finlay. Uh, thanks, President Officer. And can I move the amendment in my name? I see that we are in groundhog year and uh, the lead role was played by Mr Tompkins this time. Uh, the UK pitch is sitting on the edge of the abyss. We have lorry parks being set up, medicine stockpiled, food hoarded, and Parliament in turmoil. Vote for the deal, he says. His own side won't vote for the deal. We see a Prime Minister, a Prime Minister in name only, alone, credibility in tatters, the worst holder of that political office since the last holder of that political office. Losing vote after vote, minister after minister, every shred of credibility she ever had, making the UK a laughing stock across the world. It is indeed tragedy. We've heard her parroting, strong and stable. Brexit means Brexit. And now we have a prime minister so lacking in self-awareness and comprehension of reality that all she can say is that her rejected deal is the only way to prevent a no deal. This is the deal that has been defeated by a record number in the House of Commons. It was defeated for a second time by almost 150 in the chamber. And it's a, a deal that I hope if it's brought back will be rejected again. Of course, today we're seeing uh, the House of Commons MPs will vote through a series of indicative votes. I have to say, you know it's getting serious, presiding officer, when they're taking the revolutionary step of using pens and paper to vote. I'm glad I'm not there. I don't think my heart could take all the excitement of seeing Rhys Mogg with his swan quill pen, ink pot and parchment paper. Uh, today we're discussing the prospect of revoking Article 50 and a direct response to the issues uh, raised by Patrick Harvey. A, a referendum with the Remain option is, of course, the option we would like to see as a public vote. And the reference to a public vote, public vote, reflects the wording that my party agreed unanimously at our conference. But Mr Harvey, of course, will understand that for many other reasons, not least the impact of universal credit, not least the hostile environment and immigration, or the policies that see poverty and homelessness increase, and many others, we also want to see a general election to bring an end to this disastrous government. And I hope Mr Harvey is with us on that too. Certainly. Patrick Harvey. Just to be clear, Mr Finlay is making that argument in addition to a referendum on any withdrawal option, not as an alternative. 
that's what, that's Neil what I said to Mr Harvey when I spoke to him earlier today. And as for his second point, it won't be news to him that Labour has proposed a plan for a customs union and single market alignment, a plan that has been identified as credible by the European Union and by European uh, government leaders. Had that succeeded, we wouldn't be facing the abyss today. However, tonight, Labour will support the Kyle Wilson Amendment in Parliament that will ensure that any deal has to be endorsed by a referendum. And I hope that helps Mr Harvey and that we can continue to work together with his party, with the Liberal Democrats and with the SNP, uh, speaking in this Parliament with a common voice, a common voice, as we have done all the way through, exposing the Tory party for what they have done. Because, President Officer, we've worked cooperatively with other parties in this Parliament, and I have to say we will do so again. We've met regularly with the Cabinet Secretary and the uh, spokespeople from all of the other parties. We've cooperated on the continuity bill. We've worked uh, on joint work with the Welsh Assembly. We've even attempted, all of us, to work with the Conservative Party. Doing that has not been a traitor, nor is it selling out. It is the sensible and reasonable thing to do in the interest of our constituents, in the interest of Scotland, the UK, and indeed Europe. President officer, today's debate focuses on Article 50. We have to end the deadlock. If no referendum, and then we come to a choice between no deal and revoke, then I think all of us who are sensible, that's excluding that side, would take the revoke line. We in the Scottish Labour Party interests of the country would take that, no thank you, would Members in take this last that minute. line, as, as opposed to the disaster, the imminent disaster of an ordeal. But, President Officer, I would caution against any decision being one of Parliament alone. The referendum was about giving people a say, so they must have a say in our future. Thank you very much. I now call on Willie Rennie. Mr Rennie, four minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, I was distressed when we voted to leave the European Union. Um, of course, I was concerned about the economic impacts. I was concerned about the potential threat to travel, to the threat to the Erasmus scheme, the threat to lots of perhaps European students coming to this country. I was distressed about all those things. But what I was really most distressed about was what kind of message it sent to the rest of the world about what kind of country that we were. Because I like to think we were an outward-looking, optimistic, generous nation that was prepared to work with our neighbours. And I'm afraid whatever else, what other message it sent, Brexit certainly sent the message that Britain wanted to be on its own, doing things differently from our neighbours. And I thought that was a regrettable step. Now, I'm not saying that everybody was of that opinion, but I think that was the very powerful message that was sent to the rest of the world. Yes, certainly. Jamie Green. I thank the member for, for giving way, but does he accept also uh, the Scots who voted to leave the EU didn't do so because they felt isolationist or wanted to send that message, but for very other reasons and quite uh, appropriate ones at that. Will you, Rennie? I do, I do recognise the multitude of reasons as to why people voted for Brexit, and we cannot just go back to the way that we were um, after the referendum and after this process. We've got to recognise that some people felt as if they were being left out in society. Many communities, certainly in the north of England, felt like that. And that's why we need to address those fundamental issues to make sure that people don't use Brexit or a process like that in future in order to express their views, that there is another mechanism in order to do that. But if you contrast the Brexit process with the process of devolution, devolution built up through a constitutional constitutional convention, the various marches, manifesto commitments from all the parties, a white paper fully involving all the different parties and right across society, and then endorsed by a referendum. Contrast that with Brexit, which is astonishingly different. I mean, what government put forward a referendum for something it does not want to happen? No white paper was produced, no detail, no combined plan, no consultation across society about what Brexit would actually mean in the end. Nothing of that happened. And actually, when you look back to the constitutional convention process leading through the Scottish Parliament, it's quite striking how beneficial that process was to the Brexit process. I think that adds more weight to the case for having a people's vote, having that confirmatory referendum, because we did not have the detail before the referendum. No matter what people say, 
we did not have the detail. We had slogans on the side of a bus. We have a multitude of different grievances that were put forward by a multitude of different campaigns. And therefore, how on earth can we hold them to account? I mean, if the, if the Brexiteers can't agree amongst themselves now what Brexit means, how on earth were we supposed to know in 2016 what Brexit meant? There was no way we could possibly have known back then if they cannot agree now. Another reason why we should have a confirmatory referendum. And this is just the beginning. I mean, we think of it, I'm not just I'm in my last minute. If we, if we agree the withdrawal agreement, however slim chances that is, the debate has only just begun. We've got the free trade agreement to agree. That's going to take months, years possibly, to negotiate. That's why we're debating the backstop in Ireland, because we're not optimistic we'll get it done within the transition phase. We think the division and the discomfort is going to end if we have this withdrawal agreement. That is just not the case. And the economic consequences are quite significant. We're already feeling them with the lack of immigration in this country. We've got a perfect storm of an ageing population, growing demand on social care and nursery education, but also real demands on the NHS, as well as a growing sector like food and drink, but also the hospitality sector. At the same time as we're cutting off a large section of the European Union to come here and work and help us grow our economy and grow our public services. This is madness. Another reason why we need a people's vote. So there is a way to make the torture stop. We can break out of this stalemate by letting the people decide. If Parliament can't build a consensus, the people should decide. That's why we support that public vote. And if the EU and UK can't make the time for that to happen, we should revoke Article 50 to yeah, give us yeah. that time. Yeah, it yeah. is impressive that so many have signed the petition. Their voice cannot be ignored. Yeah, yeah, well, Thank you very much. I now move to the open debate. Type four minute speeches. I call Bruce Crawford to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr thank, Crawford, please. Thank you, Mr. Officer. Can I sincerely thank Patrick Harvey and the Green Party, first of all, yes. for bringing forward this important, albeit short, debate on the Brexit process. Mr. Officer, President Officer, I'd like to begin my contribution by looking at the petition to revoke Article 50 that's now attracted over 5.8 million signatures. Over 12,000 of these signatures have been generated in the Stirling constituency. That's about 13% of my constituents. Now, of course, uh, in the Stirling constituency, 68% also voted to remain in the EU during the 2016 referendum. Before I say any more, let me say I fully respect the wishes of those people who voted to leave in the Stirling constituency. I, I have, however, got to say, I've been surprised by the fact that Stephen Kerr, the Tory MP for Stirling, refuses to review his position given that 68% of the voters in his own constituency voted to remain. Now, I also fully respect the fact that he himself was a Leave voter, but surely he should reflect on the views of the vast majority of voters in his own constituency and consider following their wishes. Instead, I've got to say, unfortunately, rather arrogantly, he refuses to do so, as he just outlined in the Stirling Observer today. Now, it's obviously no secret that I remain a committed Remain supporter and frankly would take any route to derail Brexit. And I say this for two very important reasons. Yes, I will. Adam Tonkins. I'm, I'm very grateful to the member for giving, for giving way. I, I, imagine that Scotland had voted yes to independence in 2014 and that negotiations to separate Scotland from the rest of the UK had proved difficult as we warned that they would. Would the member support calls to revoke independence? Bruce Crawford. There was one fundamental difference between 2014 and 2016. There was over 600 pages of well-argued reason why Scotland should be an independent country, unlike the, the letters on the side of a bus, as we currently ha had in 2016. <laughs> now, I say that I'm, I'm committed to the real uh, Brexit for two very important reasons. Firstly, because of the social and economic damage that any form of Brexit would inflict on Scotland. But I'm particularly concerned about the impact leaving will have on EU citizens in Scotland. They have been innocent bystanders and the way they've been treated has been shocking. All the way through this utter calamity of a process that will not go down well and has been a very sad and disturbing chapter of UK history. But just as importantly, the right to freely travel, to live, to work anywhere 
in the other 27 countries of the EU as a European citizen has been stolen away from present and future generations of Scots if we proceed with Brexit. That makes me angry and despairing. But the second reason I see, want to see Brexit derailed is at the end of the day, all of this argument fundamentally for me boils down to one very simple question. Do you believe in democracy and do you believe in the sovereignty of the people of Scotland? Now, I know the rest of the UK, uh, has, the Parliament has traditionally been seen and historically been seen as being sovereign, even although that notion has taken a significant blow this week by the actions of the Tory government, signalling they're prepared to ignore the will of Parliament. However, the position in Scotland, given strength by the claim of right, is that the people of Scotland are sovereign. Therefore, for us here in Scottish Parliament, I believe the choice is a very clear one. Either you believe in the right of the people of Scotland to choose their own future, or you do not. At the end of the day, it all boils down to that simplest of propositions. Well, I know where I stand on that proposition. I stand with the people of Stirling and of Scotland. They voted to remain, and therefore I'll do everything to try to fulfill their views. In closing, President Officer, I believe, the SNP believe in the sovereignty of the people of Scotland. At decision time this evening, we'll just see how many parties and how many MSPs are prepared to put the wishes of the people of Scotland first and foremost and give us a way out of this Brexit madness through a people's vote. Call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am rather disappointed, but not surprised, that the Scottish Greens have chosen parliamentary time yet again on something that was out with this parliament. This is something we see far too often in this parliament. Rather than focusing on legislating to improve our schools, our hospitals, our justice system, and holding the Scottish Government to account. Revoking Article... No, thank you. Revoking Article 50 would be undemocratic in the extreme. Scotland voted to stay part of the United Kingdom and the Government of the United Kingdom gave the British people the choice whether to leave or remain as members of the European Union. In the ensuing referendum, people voted to leave the EU and have voted for in the biggest number of electoral history that we've ever seen. This result must be respected and upheld, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is inspiring to see that those uh, who are on the other side of the referendum promoting we should once again have a second one. We have seen the same when it comes to independence. It would seem that the Greens and the SNP want to keep us voting in the great European tradition until we deliver the correct result. This is not how democracy works, Deputy Presiding Officer. People who voted uh, for political parties and people who voted to carry out their instructions should be listened to. The SNP said there are a number of demands during withdrawal agreement. They called for the, the deal to prevent a no-deal scenario. We have that. They called for a transition period. We have one. They called for EU citizens' rights to be protected. They have been. They called for a hard border in Ireland not to happen. There will not be one. I could go on, Deputy Presiding Officer. The vast majority of people in, have tested the SNP and the surrounding deal. They have been met and they've been left with. And all we've seen is opposing. And it can only be because we're agitating for independence. This is not the way we should be going. There is significant support uh, across the business community in Scotland uh, for the deal. The NFU have said it will allow trade in agricultural goods and UK goods and foods and drink to continue through the transition period. Diageo have also supported the deal and have said that it will uh, give the travel and it will give the direction uh, and it will ensure that there is fairness during the interim period. So Ian Wood has said that the deal is both workable and better than the current system that we have because we'll be part of the common market membership but we will not be maintained and will have many of the advantages. Scottish businesses is therefore clear they want members of parliament to back the deal. The Scottish National Party would do well to remember that there is only one deal on the table and this is they have been opposing to ensure that the, the no deal scenario becomes even more uh, of a, an opportunity going forward. Deputy Presiding Officer, for far too long the outcome of the whole country is to deliver a result of a referendum and to leave the European Union in an orderly and a managed way. And we want to see that orderly and managed way. The withdrawal agreement negotiated by the Prime Minister, whilst far from perfect, does just that. 
it very much gives the opportunity for us to ensure that we would have that transition period and that we would have that opportunity to have a negotiated way out of the situation. I very much hope that Parliament will approve the deal in the coming days and I support the amendment in the name of Adam Tompkins. Thank you. Johan Lamont, followed by Ruth Maguire. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm happy to be involved in this debate on an issue of monumental significance for families and communities right across the United Kingdom. And I say not just letting down people in Scotland, but letting down people right across the United Kingdom. We have been let down by the Tory government, but I also observe and welcome the fact that people across party at a UK level, including Tories, are doing their best to try and sort this problem out. And we should at least recognise that. Now, I'm conscious that time is limited and there is insufficient time to rehearse all the arguments about how and why we ended up here. With the UK government in chaos, last time I looked, an uncertainty scaled up to a whole new level. But to be clear, I support the right of people to have a final say on the Brexit project, to endorse either a deal to leave or to remain. And if and when that vote happens, I shall be campaigning emphatically to remain. Liam Kerr. Thank you, and I thank you for taking the intervention. Does the member agree with her colleague Barry Gardner that Labour is not a Remain party and that uh, it would have difficulty supporting a referendum on any Brexit deal? John no. Lamont. No, I don't agree with him. Now, I do not pretend, nor would I argue, should anyone else assert it, that this decision is an easy one. There are concerns, and some have been articulated across the other side of the chamber about the consequences of having um, a vote. But I am clear, given the end evidence, that it remains the right decision. To kind of phrase, I've been on a journey. I was a reluctant Remainer, valuing the role of European cooperation post-war, yes. The benefits in particular to young people of being able to travel, yes. The role of the EU in securing social and employment rights, yes. But at the same time, uneasy about the EU role in bearing down on the economic decisions being made in Greece and Portugal, for example, unhappy with decisions that felt distant and not rooted in local needs and experience, and concerned about the distance between some decisions and those affected, the same feeling that led me to support devolution way back in the day. But I am absolutely clear that whatever people saw in the referendum debate, whatever they imagined leaving would bring, they could not possibly have imagined this. Frightening evidence of job losses, perhaps with most impact on those who can afford it least. Routine discussions about stockpiling basics of foods and medicines have become the norm. And millions spent by government and businesses to manage a degree of uncertainty, which was simply beyond imagining. This isn't any longer a theoretical argument or an academic argument. This is not a political idea or policy that we can argue back and forth in this chamber. This is having a direct impact in the real world right now. And I understand Adam Tompkins' argument about not wanting to debate about the Constitution. We cannot avoid debating this constitutional decision if we are concerned about jobs, about skills, about the future of our young people. They are absolutely entwined with each other. They are not separate things to debate. We have to confront one in order to deal with the other. What we see here and now is surely not what people voted for. Even the most pessimistic Remainer argument at the time of the referendum did not stoop so low as to describe what we see now. And it has certainly never, uh, what is now happening was never painted on the side of a bus. We need to think now about how the debate is taken forward. This bit is the easy bit, arguing our corner, confirming our certainties to our colleagues across the chamber. It isn't a proxy debate about other constitutional arguments. And I would urge my colleagues who do take a different view on the question of Scottish independence to be clear that this is a separate argument and you must be as inclusive as possible in taking this forward. We need to win the argument amongst those who are not already persuaded, not just those who voted Remain, but those one million people in Scotland who voted Leave without any one of the main parties asking them to do so, and who voted with the best of intentions and close, with hope please. for the future. I would urge people to understand the choice now is not shrugging our shoulders, just get on with it. 
There are massive consequences right across the United Kingdom. And on that basis, I support a people's vote and the opportunity for people to make a decision about the best future for this country. The last of the open debate speeches is from Ruth Maguire. Presiding officer, the UK Parliament has to take control from Theresa May and support giving the people a say on her disastrous Brexit deal. Ensuring an option to remain in Europe is on the ballot paper. The Green motion that we debate today commends the more than 5 million signatories to the UK petition to revoke Article 50. But of course, we know here in Scotland that the UK government has form for ignoring around 5 million folk. This whole sorry process has shone a light on a number of things, but most of all, it's utterly demolished Tory claims that the UK is a partnership of equals. Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in Europe. Repeated votes in the Scottish Parliament and the compromise option of single market and customs union membership put forward by the Scottish Government have all been ignored by the Tories. That does not feel like a partnership of equals. Not at the moment, no. Presiding officer, like many colleagues um, who were concerned about EU nationals in, the, in my constituency, I took the opportunity to reach out to those living in, in Ayrshire. There were strong themes of anger, unfairness and a, a sense of losing belonging in their responses to me. If I can share some of them with the chamber. One person said, we think as a family it's disgraceful how the UK government is treating us. We've lived in Scotland for over 12 years, paying taxes, not taking any benefits, and now the UK government wants us registered as though we are cows. We're thinking we, we were thinking we were settled here, but the UK government has made us think differently. Another person said, you can imagine I feel deeply insulted by the whole affair as I've been living in the UK for 50 years. There was no need to apply for British citizenship as we're all Europeans, and I felt I belonged here, but no more. Another said, I'm 72 years old and I've lived in Scotland for 68 years. I consider it a disgrace that I should be told I now have to apply for the right to reside. Presiding officer, I consider that a disgrace too. Along with the upset caused by the treatment of our EU citizens, one of the most striking things to me has been the contrast between the way Ireland has been treated by the EU and the utter contempt with which Scotland has been treated by the Westminster government. Solidarity and support for Ireland from its EU partners, while Scotland has our national interests ignored and the powers of the Scottish Parliament eroded, whilst we're left at the mercy of an increasingly dysfunctional and chaotic Westminster system. Surely no one in this chamber sent here on the votes of our Scottish constituents could seriously look them in the eye and tell them it's right and proper that a handful of DUP MPs hold more sway over Scotland's future than our national parliament. Surely no one in this chamber would support Scotland being disadvantaged in UK funding arrangements due to outrageous attempts by the UK government to win DUP votes. Presiding officer, we need to avoid both the catastrophe of a no deal and the damage which would be caused by the Prime Minister's bad deal. The UK Parliament has to take control, give the people their say, and remaining in Europe must be an option on the ballot. We move to the closing speeches, and I call James Kelly for four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. After all the debates that we've had on this Parliament on Brexit, it seems almost astonishing that on the 27th of March, two days from the defined exit day, uh, there still is an absolute lack of clarity on the way forward, that because we face a Brexit car crash of massive proportions, and it's that which uh, drove nearly a million people to come out onto the streets of London on, on Saturday, and also the petition of 5.8 million uh, people have uh, expressed their, their view and their frustration in large, large numbers. And I think uh, that's something that has built over time since the referendum in 2016. And the reason for that, as Joanne Lamont pointed out, is because of the impact on families and communities, not just throughout Scotland, but throughout the UK. There are three fundamental problems uh, with Brexit and with no deal. Uh, it's the economic damage that caused the undermining of opportunity for people and the infringement on people's rights. In terms of the, the economy, uh, it's quite clear 
that trade will be affected and will be reduced. And as the Bank of England has pointed out, that will result in an increase in inflation and an increase in, in interest rates. And some assessments have said that could mean the loss of 100,000 jobs in Scotland. And the impact of that means that uh, people then struggle to pay their bills, they struggle to pay their mortgages, and ultimately their, their standard of living, their ability to support their family uh, gets completely undermined. And that's why you see people taken to the streets and taken to the petition website in such large numbers. Willie Rennie uh, referenced uh, Erasmus, and that's a, a scheme that many have spoke about in this chamber over a period of time uh, of great benefit to Scottish students in terms of exchange visits. It covers 53% of those visits. And the potential ending of that scheme uh, not only loses the opportunity, but loses the ability of Scottish students to make the most of their education and then to go on to make uh, a crucial contribution in the economy. Uh, Bruce Crawford mentioned you know, people's rights in terms of EU citizens and the, f the fact that the uncertainty that the EU citizens stay in and contributing in Scotland face uh, is something that is a, of a real concern. I think what has been the fundamental issue here, as Patrick Harvey pointed out, has been the inability of the Tory party to, to compromise. Even at this late stage in time, when you look back to the weekend, in order to try and find a solution, who did uh, Theresa May call to checkers? She called the Grand Wizards, and down they came from the Shires in their Jaguars and their sports cars uh, into a meeting that had uh, more men called David than women in the room. Uh, a, really, a really sort of uh, select and narrow ga gathering. And that's why, as Neil Finlay uh, pointed out, the, the withdrawal agreement will continue to be doomed. And from that point of view, uh, it was right that people then look at a, a lengthy extension of Article 50 with a view to seeking a public vote. And like Joanne Lamont, uh, on that referendum with Remain on the ballot paper, uh, I would certainly support Remain. If, however, if that, uh, if that option crashes out and we're left in a position where there's no deal, then we should uh, seek the option of revoking Article 50. These are, these are serious times, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and we all have to live up to our responsibilities on that. Jamie Green, four minutes, please. Officer, much of the political conversation, um, not just this afternoon, but in recent days, weeks and months, and more so in Scotland, is centred around the premise that Parliament and the people are at odds uh, one with another. Claims that never before has there been such a disconnect between the will of the people and the will of politicians. And some claim, as the motion and its amendments today suggest, that this Parliament's voice is not being listened to. But how can it be, presiding officer, that 38% of the people outside of this parliament voted to leave the EU, but less than 5% of the members within this parliament, at least publicly, admit to agreeing with them? Can we honestly say that this place is truly representative of the people it claims to serve? No, I, I was elected, uh, uh, let me make some progress. I've got a lot to say on this subject. I was elected to this parliament just under three years ago, and one month before the EU referendum delivered the result of the British people. And it was an interesting time to be elected to a parliament. But at no point did I think we would be having a debate in this place where every political party in this chamber, except for on these benches behind me, is willing to put their name to a motion which seeks to overturn the result of a referendum in which one million Scots agreed with the final outcome. In my short time as an MSP, I sit here on a daily basis and listen to debate after debate from these benches, which deliberately and willingly try not just to brush aside, but disrespect Absolutely. the results of two referenda that this country Absolutely. has faced. <laughs> two historic referenda, two referenda with high turnouts, with significant public engagement, brushed aside because MSPs think that they know better. Yeah. Mr. Harvey, you please tell me why. Patrick Harvey. I'm, I'm very grateful to the member for giving why. And I, I hear the, the, the passion with it which he says that the 38% the uh, 
uh, in Scotland who voted for Leave should not be ignored. Why on earth should the 62% who voted Remain be ignored, or indeed the 48% across the whole of the UK who have been so comprehensively ignored by the UK Government taking this process to the extreme? Jamie Green. Perhaps Mr Harvey can answer this question. Why does he choose to ignore the 55% of Scotland who want to remain in the UK? Please tell me that. That's a real question that I haven't heard an answer to. On, an, on a note of consent, though, Mr Harvey's motion begins with these words. It commends the more than 5 million signatories to the UK Parliament petition to revoke Article 50. And perhaps surprisingly to some, I commend them too. Just as I commend those who marched in London, many of them I consider my friends. Now, I don't agree with them, but it gives me pride that we live in a society which allows for that demonstration. But do not forget, for every one person who signed that petition, there are three who didn't but voted to leave the EU. Yeah. Online petitions and street marches do not make for constitutional change. Yeah. If you go to the public and ask for a decision, you must respect that yeah. decision. Yeah. I have, I've got very little time. The Scottish Greens put out a tweet today earlier saying that the Tories are very upset about today's motion. And do you know what? They are. Because I'm upset that this parliament wants to pass a motion that has no respect for the 43% of voters in North Ayrshire who voted to leave, or the 55% in Angus, or the 49.9% in Murray. So I challenge constituency members, when you go back to your constituencies on Friday, you tell them, those people who voted to remain in the UK and who voted to leave the EU, why you sought to revoke that message. And I don't think the SNP has given full thought to the consequences. It's a fundamental error of judgment on their part. Yeah. They're setting a very dangerous precedent too. If one referendum goes the way that you don't want it to, you simply call it again. If you yeah. think people have changed their minds, you call it again. If the divorce is too painful or difficult, you call it again. I know for a fact if the tables were turned and we were coming forward with plans to overturn the result of an independence referendum, the SNP would be in uproar over our demands to deny the will of the people. The hypocrisy Just knows closing. no ends from these benches. Starting officer, we will reject, Mr. Harvey, we will reject this closing. motion, quite simply, because there is only one party in this parliament which res respects the outcome of both the referendum this country has voted on. That party sits on these benches. Fiona Hislop, five minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. In any debate on Brexit, we should always, always remember this. The overwhelming majority of people in Scotland voted to remain. Scotland should not be taken out of the EU against our will. Scotland's votes to remain have been ignored by the Tory government, and we have been ignored since. Votes in this Parliament have been disregarded. The Scottish Government's compromise proposals have been dismissed. And the Prime Minister has instead pandered to the extreme Eurosceptics in her own party, regardless of the cost to Scotland. And that has to change, and our voice must be heard. And we support holding another referendum with Remain on the ballot paper or revoking, revoking Article 50 to avoid a catastrophe. Now, Adam Tompkins argues that the only option to avoid no deal is the Prime Minister's deal. But we now know that there is another way to avoid the catastrophe of no deal, and that is to revoke Article 50. And that's the subject of Joanna Cherry's amendment, which has been accepted for voting and debate in Parliament this evening. And can I also quote to the, the Conservatives, a Conservative Minister, Foreign Office Minister Mark Field on the 24th of March. My personal view is that I would be happy to revoke Article 50. I appreciate that is probably a minority view, but if we get to this utter paralysis, and I sincerely hope in the next 48 hours, 72 hours we do not, then if that becomes an option, it's an option I personally would take. If a UK government minister can take that position, why on earth can the Conservative opposition in this party, in this parliament, not understand that argument? The previous referendum of the EU was over two years ago. Much has emerged about the flaws in that referendum in that time. We now have better understanding of the potential impacts of leaving the EU and the damage that would result. And Willie Rennie, I ref think, reflected that in his thoughtful speech. We understand that the hard Brexiteers, however, have now taken control. People are allowed to change their minds in light of the new information and new circumstances since the referendum. That is the very nature of democracy. Indeed, polling suggests that some people have done so. And I would say to Jamie Green most sincerely, 
he talked about the EU referendum being the final outcome. That's the problem. It wasn't the final outcome because why on earth are Westminster still so trying to determine what the final outcome of Brexit is in a series of votes two and a half years since the original referendum? And of course, it's thanks to the group of Scottish parliamentarians cross party that we know the UK has the right to revoke Article 50. The UK has not left the EU. The European Court of Justice judgment on the 10th of December creates a clear route for the UK to revoke notification under Article 50 and remain in the EU. If anything, developments since the referendum have demonstrated that the leaders of the Leave campaign demonstrated contempt for the electorate, both Leavers and Remainers. They did not advance a single plan or position for cynical, tactical, political reasons. And that is why it's not a final outcome, because the content of what would be the plan was never known. Instead, they issued the false claims about extra money for the NHS. And Joanne Lamont is right, and Alexander Stewart is wrong. This crisis does affect things to do with this palm. It affects jobs, it affects housing, it affects the future of our young people, and absolutely it must be debated in this parliament. A further referendum with a clear informed choice conducted properly would respect the electorate by offering a proper choice instead of the flawed vote in 2016. And I think it's very important this parliament does come together. And I welcome Neil Finlay's comments and his opening remarks about the efforts within this parliament to come together on so many different issues in relation to this area, and also by what he means by a public vote. There are times, presiding officer, when this parliament must come together. And that is this, uh, the debate uh, is one of those times in terms of how we reflect the views of people and we find a way forward. And we are not just here, um, I think, uh, to provide comment. We're not just here to be passive as the Conservatives are, uh, seem to be in, in the face of crisis. This parliament is about leading the people of Scotland and providing leadership and providing a way forward. And that is why we need to have a referendum to provide real choice with uh, clear information and to make sure that um, I, we can chart a new route forward. And I think, presiding officer, there have been many good speeches in this very short debate. It's a very important debate. I do thank the Greens for bringing it here today. We will support the main motion, but we think it should be strengthened with our amendment. I call Ross Greer to wind up the debate for eight minutes, please, Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank colleagues from across three of the other parties in this Parliament for working constructively with us on the motion and the amendments brought forward today. I think Joanne Lamont summed it up very well in saying that we cannot help but debate this. It brings us no pleasure to be debating this crisis today, but when we are talking about tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand jobs in Scotland that are at risk from what the Conservatives propose, far more in the event of a no deal. When we're talking about our rights as workers, when we're talking about environmental protections, all put at risk because of this. It would be a dereliction of duty for this parliament to pretend it's not happening, to talk about something else. And Joanne Lamont is right to say that this is a moment for those of us on both sides of Scotland's own constitutional question to come together. It is a moment for us to come together to say that we have a way out. We propose a way out of this crisis because we collectively know what is in the best interests of the people of this country. But I do want to very briefly engage with the hypothetical question that Adam Tompkins set out because I think it's an interesting one. And I would reference what Willie Rennie said about the referendum in 1997. If we had won, if the yes side had won in 2014, it would have been on the basis of a white paper. Now, I didn't agree with everything that was in that white paper, on NATO, for example. But there was, like in 97, a plan for what would have happened in 2014. Not only was there a plan for what would have happened in 2014, but there was no treaty timescale. We weren't, we weren't going to activate a two-year stop clock before anyone was ready, before anyone had come up with a plan. But most critically, in 2014, the Scottish Government proposed a One Scotland, Team Scotland approach. Every party in this parliament was invited to take part in the negotiations that would have commenced if Scotland had voted for independence. What a contrast with a UK government that can't even compromise with the moderates in its own party. What a contrast. And we should consider how we've reached this stage. How has one of the world's wealthiest countries, not at war, not suffering from a natural disaster, put itself in the position of stockpiling food and medicine? 
Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in 2016, almost two to one, and the UK result was narrowly for leave. No attempt was made by the Conservative government at Westminster to, to recognise the strong Remain votes in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, in Gibraltar. Nor did they recognise that a narrow result overall was a mandate for compromise. They've deliberately sought to ignore and circumvent this Parliament at every stage. When we've worked together to protect the interests of Scotland, even within the Brexit process, as we did with the Continuity Bill, the Conservative Westminster government has been underhand, obstructive and arrogant in its efforts to stop us. Any rational government would have realised that such a massive undertaking on the basis of a narrow result in favour of a vague idea rather than a specific plan would mean unavoidable compromise. Theresa May's government, far from rational, decided that their path to Brexit lay through the radicalised extremists on their own hard right. And of course the misjudged opportunism of calling an election to crush the Labour Party only to lose her own majority only had the outcome of making me dependent on a second group of hard right extremists in the DUP. Now proposals to remain in the EU customs union and maintain either full membership or greater alignment with the single market have been proposed by the Scottish Government, the Welsh Government, the Labour opposition and now find their most effective advocate in Tory MP Nick Bowles. If these proposals had been the basis of Theresa May's plan, I doubt those of us in the Greens and others who were inclined towards stopping Brexit completely would have had much of a chance. But if they, were if they weren't acceptable to the hard right of our own party, then they weren't acceptable to Theresa May in Downing Street. We have a Prime Minister who willingly handed her government and the country over as a hostage to Jacob Rees-Mogg. A Prime Minister who started Article 50's two-year countdown without a plan. And a Prime Minister whose electoral opportunism backfired so badly that she is dependent on the votes of a party which opposed the Good Friday Agreement to deliver a Brexit which profoundly endangers the peace process that that agreement has delivered. The Conservative strategy has been to use the biggest constitutional upheaval in modern UK history to deliver not the best or maybe the least worst outcome for this country, but to continue their own 40-year civil war over Europe. And instead of ending it as David Cameron intended, they've taken it to new heights and they've dragged the rest of us to the brink with them. It wasn't uh, until almost two-thirds of the way through the Article 50 period. Excuse me, Mr Greer. Could we have a bit of respect for speakers here, please? Thank you. Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It wasn't until almost two-thirds of the way through the Article 50 period that the UK government finally decided on their preferred outcome. And with the resignations that followed that checkers deal, it was immediately clear that the plan didn't have the support of the Prime Minister's own party. Yet instead of seeking to reach out and forge compromise with the opposition, Theresa May is still playing chicken with the madmen inside her own party, risking the catastrophe of no deal in this painfully drawn out attempt to get her own terrible deal passed. That strategy has failed though. It has seen the Prime Minister's deal rejected by the House of Commons twice. And it's demonstrated that while there have been crueler conservative governments in modern history, there has been no government as incompetent as this one. Scotland voted for none of this, presiding officer. Today's green motion gives us the opportunity to assert what we believe is the best way out of this crisis. And for that, we can thank my green colleague, Andy Whiteman, who led a cross-party group of politicians comprising myself, Alan Smith MEP, and Joanna Cherry MP from the SNP, and MEPs from the Labour Party, David Martin and Catherine Styler. The historic ruling in that Article 50 case established that the UK has the right to unilaterally revoke Article 50. It's worth noting that the Conservative government fought us every stage of the way in that process. They're the only government I'm aware of that has gone to such lengths to limit their own options. But they lost, and we won. So now we have a way out. The Brexiteers had their chance to negotiate an orderly exit from the EU. Their uncompromising, impossibilist approach has squandered that chance, all but collapsed their government and put the whole country at risk. Fortunately, MPs are beginning to take back control from that government, but the process is clearly far from over. 17.4 million people in the UK, 1 million people in Scotland did vote leave. I doubt many of them voted for this humiliating mess. And I can only ask the Brexiteers and the Conservative Party, when their own government is estimating that Scotland will lose between 80 and 100,000 jobs from their Brexit proposal, is that really what they think they voted for and why are they backing it now? There is a way to check what people voted for though. This decision can be handed over by a deadlocked Westminster to the people. Let the public decide between this bad deal and the opportunity to remain part of the European family of nations. 
But if MPs refuse to give the public that final say, if they cannot come to an agreement as the clock winds down to no deal, then we must say today, on behalf of the people of Scotland, on behalf of all those who will be hurt, who will be put at risk, who will suffer from a no deal Brexit, we must say that Article 50 should be withdrawn and the Brexit crisis should be ended. Colleagues, today European Council President Donald Tusk told MEPs that they must stand up for the increasing majority of people in the UK who want to stay in the European Union. He said that they may feel that they are not sufficiently represented by the UK Parliament. I know the feeling. But they must feel represented by the European Parliament because they are Europeans. Today we have the opportunity to show the people of Scotland that we represent them, that we defend Scotland's overwhelming Remain vote. This is a European nation. We are a European people. We believe in a people's Europe. And we know it is time to let the people cancel Brexit. That concludes the debate on revoking Article 50. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business. If you could... Point of order, Tom Arthur. Officer, I rise to make a point of order under rules 8.5.3 and 8.5.6. These concern the admissibility of amendments and the selection of amendments. In the amendment in the name of Adam Tompkins, it concludes by stating, with reference to a withdrawal agreement, to leave the UK with a withdrawal agreement. I wonder if you can advise, presiding officer, whether it would have been permissible for that amendment to make reference to the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement. Well, that's a matter for the member who has put forward that amendment and a matter for the presiding officer who decides to accept that amendment. If Mr Arthur wishes, I'm more than happy that this be considered further and a response given to him.